I saw this uh, new take on an old saying somewhere around New Year's. It said, new year, new me, and the new one is worse. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about how Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection spell something new, and that new is definitely better. Welcome here. My name is Dave Fields. I'm our lead pastor here. If you're new or just joining us, or if you're joining us online for the first time, welcome. Uh, Last week, if you weren't here, we did a deep dive into a text that is often uh, seen as placing some uh, significant restrictions on how women might be able to function in ministry. We looked at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. And if you didn't get a chance to hear it, you, you probably want to go back and listen to the, uh, you know, you can download the podcast or, or watch it on, on YouTube. But essentially, here's what we did. Um, I was trying to show that when we read this text in its historical context and pay a lot of attention to the grammar um, and the flow of the argument that Paul is making, it is best to understand this text not as a prohibition on women in teaching or leading roles uh, for all times and all places, but it's limited. Uh, It's an instruction that was meant to deal with false teaching and the abrasive behavior of women in Ephesus in the first century. And so I wanted to show that that there is a consistency between what Paul says there and the way that he really does affirm women who serve in teaching and leading roles. And today, we're going to focus in on those positive examples, and and we're going to ask what that would mean for us. So we're going to look at what I want to call like these new creation realities. And then we'll be be answering, as we do that, we'll kind of be answering two uh, maybe outstanding objections that people might have. Like one, why do we see that there's an all-male priesthood in the Old Testament, and it looks like into the Gospels uh, as well? Now, does that change? And the second question is like, just what about women in significant leadership roles? How do we understand that? Aren't there other texts that, uh, that also limit women's ministry? So we're going we're gonna to dive into that today. So one of that important objection comes about like, well, in the Old Testament and, uh, and into the Gospels, we, we see that it's still just a male-only priesthood. What do we do with that? We need to remember this, that the Old Covenant, the way that we related to God, prior to the coming of Jesus, within that old covenant, that was inseparably linked to the tabernacle and then temple system, both of which have been fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus. Just read the book of Hebrews. He says, those things are over. Something new has come. And uh, as Alita Friesen and Chris Price say it, this makes it doubtful This makes it doubtful that the pattern of an all-male priesthood should have any continued theological bearing on the New Testament church and therefore women's place in leadership. Uh, But it's also true, Jesus gathers around himself 12 male disciples. What is with that? Well, that choice is because they had the function of representing Uh, Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, who each descended from the sons of Israel. So you see, Jesus is reconstituting Israel around himself, and it would only make sense within that society to use men to represent uh, a new Israel that is coming. So there's this decisive moment. However, the decisive moment comes at the beginning of what we call the new covenant, or this new agreement between us and God. And when does that come into effect? It comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he took wine, and he said, this is my body, which will be given for you. And we're going to celebrate that later today. But here's the interesting thing about that as well. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Something new is happening as a result of what I'm about to do on the cross. Paul calls it the new creation. It's this new situation that we come into. And the work of Jesus on the cross begins a new situation. I think the fact that women are the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus and Jesus sends women to announce that to his male disciples is a signal that highlights this new reality. 
So let's look at how this new creation or this new covenant situation plays out. As, as the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters uh, at the creation in Genesis chapter 1, bringing order out of chaos, we see something again like this. In Acts chapter 2, you see uh, after Jesus' death and his ascension, resurrection and ascension to the Father, the Spirit then comes and hovers over his church, the community of God. And God is renewing God's creational intent, one which brings people together from every tribe and nation and language and, and all the genders as well. So male and female are brought together underneath of this. Jesus is uniting his people under the ministry of the Spirit. So we have this community of Jesus followers, men and women, and they're gathering for prayer, and then the Spirit comes and rests over all of them. And then this is what we read in Acts 2.4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. And as they speak in these other languages, people from all over the Mediterranean basin who had come to worship God at Pentecost were gathered there, and they were hearing about Jesus in their own language, and it was this incredible moment. And and then Peter gets up, and he says, let me explain to you what's going on here. And to do that, he reaches into the prophet Joel from the Old Testament, and he quotes Joel chapter 2 saying this, in the last days, God says... I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Peter is saying this, these are those days. What Joel was talking about, has now come on this day of Pentecost. With the Spirit's coming comes a new moment. The new creation is now here. And notice the emphasis in the Joel text is on how God sends His Spirit on all people. That's emphasized here, men and women, young and old. There's no distinction between sex or age. Notice how on both men and women is repeated. It's highlighted in this text. This is that, Peter says. The new creation is breaking in, and one of these new creation realities is the healing of the divide between men and women. Paul will summarize how this impacts the community in Galatians 3, verses 23 to 29. Let me read that for you. He says, before the coming of this faith, that is the faith in Jesus Christ, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. That is, we are locked up under this old covenant reality. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. So there's this shift that Paul is is recognizing, a shift from uh, the old covenant to the new, a shift, a radically new way that God has given us to relate to him. We're now relating to him differently. And he says, we will relate to others differently too. What will this new creation situation mean? Look at what he says next in verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ. For all of you who were baptized, pardon me, into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Jesus' work shifts things. Now, this doesn't, here's what Paul doesn't mean. It doesn't obliterate the category of Jew and Gentile as though ethnic diversity is no longer a fact or no longer matters. It's not true. Nor is he saying it's a situation where slavery wasn't still going to function. Unfortunately, it functioned for way too long, although it was the seeds of the gospel that began to address this. Absolutely. Or he's not saying that sex differentiation between men and women are now irrelevant. They are not. That's not what Paul means, right? God's creation, creating us in his image as male and female in Genesis 1 makes clear that there really is a sex differentiation, and that matters for who we are as humans. 
But the lines that divide, ethnic line, Jew and Gentile, socioeconomic lines, slave and free, sex differentiation, male and female, the lines that were drawn to say, now you are above and you are below. You fit here, you don't fit here. In Christ, he says, those lines no longer exist. There is no structure of above and below anymore. That cannot be in Christ. And that lays the conceptual groundwork for how Paul thinks about everything, including ministry. And so let's take a, a closer look at how this, how this begins to play out. Uh, but there's one more objection before we get into the, a lot of the positive pieces. There's one more objection that we, we do need to look at. And the objection would be this. It, it would be, well, what about 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 where it's giving qualifications for church leaders? Like, don't these say that elders or, or pastors can only be male? I've got more extensive notes in your handout because I just didn't have time to go into the nerdy details this morning on stage. So if you like nerdy details, go check the handout. Uh, but the short answer is this. These texts are not about gender. They're about character and ability that are demonstrated in your life. That's what Paul is driving at here. Now, it's hard to see in your English translation because if you open up to those texts, uh, you will see that most translations use the male pronoun he throughout. Here's the problem. Uh, the only pronoun Paul uses in the whole paragraph, the whole thing, is tis, which we translate out to whoever. It's not gendered. And I wonder if Paul didn't choose that for a specific reason, to not use gendered language on purpose. So you could, it, could, it would be translated this, whoever, tis, aspires to be an overseer, desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, Faithful to his wife. Now, his isn't in the Greek either. The, the literal phrase is a one-woman man, uh, temperate, self-controlled, etc. And that phrase, a one-woman man, is an idiom. Kind of like when I say, hey, guys, I don't mean just the men in the room. And that same idiom uh, can basically means this, somebody who is faithful to their marital commitments. They're not going to be going outside. If they're married, they're not going to be going outside of that. Because if it was uh, a one, you know, faithful to his wife, then Paul couldn't be an elder because he's not married. Jesus couldn't be an elder because he's not married. So if you, if you, if you want to take a really literalistic reading of this, it disqualifies Jesus from being a leader in the church. Okay? So let's... Um, it is an idiom that means faithful to your marriage commitments if you've made marriage commitments. Even prominent scholars who hold to all-male leadership or only male leadership, people like Douglas Moo or Thomas Schreiner, really great scholars, they agree. They say this, and you can see their actual quotes in the notes. These texts don't exclude the possibility of females in these leading roles. This is all to say this. If 1 Timothy chapter 2 isn't a blanket prohibition, and as I argued last week, I don't think it is, then there are no texts in the New Testament that say women can't lead or teach in public settings. There are none. That matters. We probably have to pay attention to that. So even, pro oh, pardon me. Uh, so let's take a closer look now at some of those positive examples. We're going to read Romans 16, 1 to 7, and see how, well, Paul seems to be really affirming women doing exactly those things. So if you open up in your Bibles, Romans 16, 1 to 7, I'm going to read that chunk. Here's what Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sancria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Apentus, who is the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who've been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. What do we have pictured here? First of all, we have Phoebe, the deacon. Last week, I pointed out that according to New Test or, um, sort of ancient conventions, it was the job of the letter carrier to read the letter out loud to the recipients and then to explain anything if people had questions about the meaning of the text. So it is, and 
Phoebe is the letter carrier. That's why Paul commends her. She's the one bringing this letter. So here we have the first person to have read and explained the book of Romans in a church setting is probably this woman, Phoebe. Here's the other thing. She is called a deacon, which is a leadership role in the church that aims to serve practical needs. It's like what we read of in Acts chapter 6. A good example of how uh, diconian, that's the word that's used of her, is, is used is in Philippians 1 verse 1. Uh, Paul writes this, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers or episkopos and deacons, diaconon. Uh, Notice God's holy people, that's used to designate the whole people of God. And then overseers and deacons designate leaders within that community. Uh, This is the same word that's used deacon of Phoebe here. Now, at Summit Drive, we take a classic kind of Baptist approach. We are a Baptist church, by the way, if you didn't know that, uh, to church leadership, which consists of that, it, really that description in Philippians 1.1 is how we order our church life. Uh, it says this, that the, the people of God, the whole people of God, and then we have leaders within it, um, these overseers and, and deacons. And leaders are there to serve and guide and care for the whole people of God. They're not to be overpowering. Now, how does that look in our case? Well, like where does authority really rest? I know that's some of your questions. Like, okay, who's who's really got authority in the church? Uh, We're a Congregationalist church. We're a Baptist church. Let me read to you from our bylaws. It says this, under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the membership of the church is the source of authority in the church. Where does authority rest in a Baptist Congregationalist church? in you. It's not in me. It's the membership. That's what our bylaws say. So if you ask, where is the authority? It's in the members of the church. That's where it rests. And that means that the members elect our deacons and delegate them a certain amount of authority to serve the community. The lead pastor then is hired by the membership. And I am wholly accountable to the membership as I report to the board of deacons. So there's this beautiful communal practice of shared life. Yes, the lead pastor is delegated a certain kind of authority to give spiritual leadership to the community. But I do that work in a community, along with other pastors and staff, along with the deacons, and along with all of those who are members of our community. As we saw last week when we looked at that word authentain used in 1 Timothy 2.12, there is an inappropriate kind of authority, and Paul structures the way that he describes the church against that. He says leaders are to be servants, and our church is structured in that same way and for those same reasons. In, in fact, in the very first uh, Baptist statement of faith, written by Thomas Huney in the early 1600s, they specifically mentioned that women can serve as deacons. Very first Baptist statement of faith empowers women for church leadership. And we at Summit Drive do the same. We have women deacons on our board. They serve you, and they oversee my ministry, and that's a wonderful thing. Now, back to our text. Second thing we see is this. Priscilla and Aquila teachers and church leaders. Paul then, he begins to greet a whole list of people in the community, and he starts with two of his closest co-workers, Priscilla and Aquila. Look at verses 3 to 5 again. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all of the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets in their home. Look at that last line for a moment the church that meets in their home. The early church in a city like, uh, like Rome would be made up of many, many house churches. Basically, your church was the size of whatever you could fit inside someone's living room. So 30, 40, maybe 50 people. And so you would have these house churches scattered all throughout the city. Now, it could be that Priscilla and Aquila are just hosting a house church. That could be. But the language Paul uses suggests that they're in a leading role. The Greek word um, synergos is a word that Paul uses only of people in the leadership class when he talks about leaders in the church community, and it's likely that this is a husband and wife team that leads a house church. We actually find out more about them when when, when we read through uh, through Acts. Here, Luke, the writer, initially introduces them with the husband's name first, Aquila 
and Priscilla. That's the convention of the day. It's still the convention of our day, right? When people introduce my wife and I, they say Dave and Catherine. That's just normal. So he introduces them that time, the first time. And then every other time he mentions them, it's Priscilla and Aquila. Against convention. The wife's name's first, and then the husband's. That's odd. If we're going to take the text seriously, we have to ask, why, why did he do that? And Paul does that. He does it in our text, too. Why name her first, then him? Well, we see this. Later in Acts 18, we see there's this guy named Apollos. He's this deeply gifted, traveling preacher, and he has this interaction with this couple. Here's what we read in verse 26. He, Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila, notice the name order again, heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Why is she named first? The most likely explanation, and scholars will point this out all over the place, is that she is likely the lead person in the teaching ministry. She's not just making the tea. She has a crucial role, maybe the lead role, in educating one of the greatest preachers in history. So we have to take that element of the text with seriousness. Now, some argue that, well, this is just a private setting. It's not a church setting, so it's okay there. And that's true. It is a private setting that's mentioned. But because this event happened in a home, shouldn't lead us to the conclusion that her ministry is limited to that setting. Nothing here or elsewhere suggests that. Like, for example, in Acts 28, 23, the same Greek word that's used of Priscilla and Aquila, um, ektathemi, pardon me, ektathemi, I've got it written in English, and I actually find it easier to read in the actual Greek. I should have just put it in there like that. But it's used to describe Paul's public teaching ministry. That's the same word that's used to describe what Priscilla and Aquila are doing here. So now if we go back to our text, the fact that Paul names this couple as most likely leaders of that house church and places her name first likely indicates that at least they share the teaching and leading or maybe she's the lead in those areas. If we're going to take the scripture seriously, and we are, we have to pay attention to the spirit order, the spirit inspired word order and grammar that's used here. So we have a female co worker, likely a leader and teacher in the church. Okay, the last and maybe most significantly, Andronicus and Junia, outstanding apostles. Verse 7 Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who've been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So who were these folks? Paul says they were in Christ before I was, and he was in Christ very early on in the Christian movement. Uh, so they were, prob- they were among the first Christians. Um, it's possible that they were there among the group who had gathered at Pentecost and may have even been a- among that 500, the group of 500 described in 1 Corinthians 15, who witnessed Jesus in his resurrected body. And they're called apostles. So what does that mean? Now, in the Bible, there's at least two categories uh, where the, uh, the word apostle is used. It is used very narrowly to describe what you might call the capital A apostles. This refers to the 12 disciples of Jesus who were eyewitnesses to his life, teaching, death, and resurrection. But Paul also lists a Paul, apostle as a form of gifting and a call of the church, and he calls a number of other people outside of that category apostles as well. Here's how Cynthia uh, Long Westfall puts it. Andronicus and Junia would be apostles in the same sense as were Barnabas, Epaphroditus, and Titus, along with the brothers who were sent to administrate the offering. Apostle is one of the foundational spiritual gifts in Paul's lists that are determined by the Spirit. Now, this verse, as you can imagine, has an interesting translation to history because apostle is a leading and authoritative role within the church. Uh, A very small number of translations today which have honestly demonstrable ideological bents against women in ministry have tried to argue that this should be translated are esteemed by the apostles or are prominent in, in the sight of the apostles. And I think that's to get around the fact that a woman is listed with this title. But that's a stretch to translate it in that way for several really nerdy grammatical reasons. 
But the fact is this, Junia was recognized as a female apostle with virtual, uh, virtual unanimously in, in the understanding of the early church right up until the Middle Ages, up until the 1300s. For example, the Vulgate, which is a, a Latin translation from the Greek, which is early on, uh, fourth and fifth century, it translates this, Junia, notable among the apostles. Now, these translations are done by uh, native ancient Greek speakers. They understand how the grammar works, and they, and they all say the same thing. They all translate in this way. Or in the fourth century, you have John Chrysostom, and he is no, he's not in favor of women in ministry, by the way, and yet he says this in his, uh, in his Romans 16 sermon. He says, to even be amongst those of note, just consider what a great enconium or a level of praise this is. Oh, how great is the devotion of this woman, Junia, that she should be even counted worthy of the appellation of apostle. Beginning in the 1300s, some translators began to masculinize the name Junia to Junius, almost certainly because the Greek construction of the phrase outstanding among the apostles is really the right one, but they just couldn't get their heads around the idea that a woman could be called an apostle to have that authoritative ministry role. However, the name Junius doesn't exist in the New Testament era. There's been countless examples of studies where people have tried to find it and it just doesn't exist there. So the, the, the possibility of the name being a masculine name simply isn't there. What are we left with as options? An honest reading prefers exactly what the NIV does here. Junia and Andronicus, probably a husband and wife team, are notable apostles. They have a key role in spreading the news of Jesus and likely carry a kind of authority because of their testimony. So what's their ministry? Well, perhaps Jesus himself commissioned them. That's possible. They were likely part of that group gathered at Pentecost, and they were sent. That's what apostle means. It means a sent one to preach the good news of Jesus, seeking to bring both men and women to faith. And Paul tells us they were outstanding in this regard. Paul mentions that both had been in prison with him, which indicates that Junia's ministry extended beyond the walls of a household or, or of her household. So this is no minimal role. When we take this text with all seriousness, paying attention to the grammar, to the word order, and how it's been translated by early native Greek-speaking theologians, what we see is Paul's beautiful affirmation of a female deacon who served the church brilliantly at great cost to herself to honor Jesus. We see a wife and husband team, yes, in that order, that's how they're named, who have a significant leading and teaching role. And we have this team of apostles, husband and wife likely, Andronicus and Junia, and they're bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus and establishing churches based on that testimony. This is what we get when we, when we try to read the text in its context as well as we can. This is the new creation situation we now inhabit. From Paul acknowledging these co-workers in the gospel, in leading and teaching roles in the early church, to the early Baptist impulse to release women to lead and to teach and to function in roles like deacon, God gifts and empowers women for ministry. This is nothing new. And I'm going to invite Pastor Jill to come, and she's going to share a little bit of her own experience of what that has looked like, um, the journey for her in her life. So, Jill. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, most of my childhood, I attended a Fellowship Baptist Church in Ontario. It was a wonderful church, um, but it was pretty conservative, especially on the topic of women's roles in the church. I remember one time when I was a teenager that it was a really big deal in that church when we got our first female usher. Yeah. <laughs> So I felt God calling me to full-time ministry from a pretty young age. The first time I felt God calling to ministry, I was probably around 10 or 11 years old. I was sitting in church, and I was listening to someone sing a song for special music. You remember when we used to have special music at church? <laughs> yeah. 
And um, I really felt God speaking to me during that song. And at the time, I felt like God was calling me to be a missionary school teacher. I liked working with children, and it was one of the few paths to full-time ministry that I felt was open to me, given the views of the church and the family that I grew up in. Now, I'm a very driven and goal-oriented type of person, so as I had an opportunity over the years, I began pursuing this goal of becoming a missionary teacher. As a preteen and teenager, I went on three different missions trips, and God continued to work in my life, growing me, challenging me, and continuing to confirm a call to full-time ministry in various ways. When I was nearing the end of high school, I began to look at Christian schools where I could get both a Christian education and a teacher's degree. In the end, I decided to attend Houghton College in upstate New York. It was a Christian liberal arts college, uh, similar to Trinity Western University here, which meant that I could both do some biblical studies and get a teaching degree. The university was part of the Wesleyan denomination, which I knew very little about at the time. Several things happened during my first year at Houghton College that would end up changing the course of my life in some significant ways. I was enrolled in the elementary education program, but I was not enjoying the classes very much. I found them to be boring. They didn't challenge me, and I'm the type of person that likes to be challenged. As part of my Christian education at Houghton, I had to take some Christian courses, including an intro to Bible class. This was the hardest class that I took in my first year at Houghton, and I loved it. I also began to learn some of the things that the Wesleyan denomination believed and realized that there were some pretty significant differences from the Baptist denomination I had grown up in. And one of those differences was their views on women's roles in the church. I was shocked to discover that the Wesleyan denomination had female pastors and that they had been ordaining women as pastors for hundreds of years. Growing up, I had heard of female pastors, but I thought they only existed in super liberal, super liberal denominations and that it was a fairly recent thing within the last like 50 to 100 years. And I also had friends and classmates who were from all sorts of different church denominations and backgrounds and had varying beliefs on this topic and many others. As I became aware of all of this, I realized that there were many things that I believed simply because that is what my church growing up at the time had taught me or my parents had taught me, but not because I had actually studied the scriptures for myself. So this realization really drove me to not just read the Bible, but to really study it, particularly when it came to the subject of women's roles in the church. I studied all of the passage that Pastor Dave has been talking about over these past two Sundays, as well as others. And as I studied the Bible and learned how to read these passages in their original context, something began to happen. Some of my views on women's roles in the church began to change. At the same time, at Houghton, for the first time in my life, I was being exposed to Christian teaching by women and hearing stories of women who had been called by God into teaching and preaching ministries in the church. The beginning of my first semester of my second year at Houghton, I remember sitting in my Intro to Christian Ministry class one day as a female Wesleyan pastor from just down the road came and shared how God had called her to be a pastor. At this point, from studying the Bible, my views on women's roles in the church had changed quite a bit, but I was still struggling in my heart to accept it. And as I listened to this woman share her story, I was so conflicted. On the one hand, I was coming to believe that the Bible probably did not restrict women the way I had thought growing up. But on the other hand, it felt like a betrayal to go against my family and, my, and what my church had taught me and what I had believed my whole life up until this point. I think I was also struggling because at the same time, God was refining his calling on my own life. 
I think I always knew deep down that if I were to accept that women could be more than ushers in the church, that the tra trajectory of my life was going to change, that maybe I wasn't going to be a missionary school teacher after all. At Houghton, every Sunday night, we would have a worship night in the chapel where the student-led worship team would lead us in singing for about an hour. This inner struggle that I had been going through all came to a head one Sunday night when I walked into the chapel for, for worship. Earlier that week in one of my classes, my professor had been talking about the Bible passage at the end of John where Jesus and Peter are talking and Jesus keeps asking Peter, do you love me? And Peter keeps answering, yes, I love you. And Jesus responds, feed my sheep. As soon as I walked into chapel that Sunday evening, I could sense that God was speaking to me. And he kept saying to me over and over again, Jill, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And I kept coming to him with my objections. Things like, well, what about my family? Or the fact that I'm a woman? And God just kept saying over and over again, feed my sheep. I had been wrestling with the decision from switching to the edu from the education major to the Bible major and from letting go of my goal of being a missionary teacher to going into church ministry. So for me, when God was saying, feed my sheep, it was really a confirmation that he wanted me to switch to the Bible major. The next morning, I walked into the registrar's office and switched majors, and I was instantly filled with peace. Now, that doesn't mean everything was easy for me from that point forward, but it marked a significant change in the direction of my life. It was one of the hardest decisions I've had to make, partly because I knew how it was going to impact my parents, and my dad in particular. Sorry, I did not expect to get emotional here, but um, even just thinking back on it um, still affects me. I remember talking to my dad on the phone about a week later, and he told me that his stomach had been in knots ever since I told him I had switched to the Bible major. I remember telling him that my stomach had been in knots every day until I switched to the Bible major. My dad and I have a good relationship today. And although we probably still don't see things quite the same in ter terms of our views of women's roles in the church, he believes that I am doing what God has called me to do. And he has even come and listened to me preach here at Summit a couple of times. There are so many more stories I could tell you about the ways that God has confirmed his calling in my life and provided for me since that day I switched to the Bible major. It has been a hard and lonely road at times. But God has been faithful to me as I have been faithful to him. And I am so thankful for this church that I have been allowed to use the teaching gifts that God has given me here. Ironically, I have ended up being a children's pastor for over a decade. It wasn't something I really planned, but just kind of ended up happening once I had children of my own. And I love it. But I am thankful that I am not limited to children's ministry here at Summit. I have been given opportunities to preach and to teach in other settings as well. I just wanted to end by saying that if there are women here today who maybe feel like you have teaching gifts, but you're struggling with how to use those gifts in the church, I'd love to grab a cup of coffee with you and just talk and hear your story. The spiritual gifts are not gender specific, but are given to all God's people, both men and women. And I would love to talk with you about how you can use your gifts. For God's kingdom. Oh, thank you so much, Jill. Yeah. I love the part of the story where you just are responding to Jesus saying, feed my sheep. That's what it means to be a pastor, is someone who feeds the sheep. And Jill, you've done that beautifully in our community, so thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your story. Listen to how Dallas Willard puts it. It's not the rights of women to occupy official ministerial roles, nor their equality with men in those roles that set the terms of their service to God and their neighbors. It's their obligations to do so. Obligations that derive from their human abilities empowered by divine gifting. I think that's it. That's what we're trying to say here. 
I would want to remind you all that ministerial leadership is never about gaining power or advancing your status, but always about the humble posture of a servant, someone who just says, I'm going to feed Jesus' sheep. And like the parable of the talents that we looked at, we are obligated to use our gifts for God's glory. So to the women out there, the young lady, the preteen girl, the prophecy that Peter quotes in Acts 2 is for you. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. It's a gift of opening your mouth and sharing the word of God with those around you. These are those days. Hear that for you today. God is the one who calls you to himself, calls you his dear child, gives you the gifts he's given you, and then releases you to use them for his glory. May you discover the deep joy of being released into the fullness of your gifting. You're released to do that, to use those gifts. To the men, young men, old men, the same promise is for you. Listen, your sons and daughters will prophesy. May you know the joy of taking your place in serving God's purposes for God's kingdom as God's one people. See, this is not just about her, but about us. Uh, this miniseries isn't about she, it's about we. We together, not just the guys, us, all of us. That's what we've been saying through this whole Shape series. For there's no competition for who gets to serve. <laughs> just the joy of living into the gifts and the calling that God gives to each one of us. As we come to the table, we are saying with Paul in Galatians 3, through Jesus, we are God's one people. Without distinction. It doesn't place us, some in higher categories or others in lower this is one of the most powerful things that the gospel of our Lord Jesus does. It gathers people from every ethnic background, every socioeconomic group, people who are as different as different can be, and says, you are one in Christ. In the ancient world, you would have civic leaders sitting down at the same table right across from the lowliest of household servants on the same level, something that would never have happened apart from that new situation in Jesus. So when we take the bread, Jesus' body, and when we take the cup, his blood that was shed for you and for me, when we take that inside of us, we are being fused together as his one people, a beautiful body called the church, where there's no place for racism or classism or sexism. They have no place at the table and in the people of Jesus. We're saying to one another through this act, I belong to you and you belong to me. We become a miracle for where else does such a diverse group of people all around the world gather like this and say we belong to each other. As we take this into ourselves, we are giving our yes to God and this new creation reality. We're anticipating the day where he'll make all things new and we're committing ourselves to enacting by God's grace all that this new reality means. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray your blessing over this community, over us, that through participating and taking your body and your blood, through the bread and the cup, we are saying again, thank you. Thank you for giving your life for us, for saving us, for redeeming us. And thank you for bringing us into a community where we belong to one another in love. So, Jesus, we give you thanks. Amen. Jesus takes these symbols from the Passover, from the time where God rescues his people Israel from their slavery in Egypt, leads them through the waters and into freedom. And Jesus takes these same symbols on that night, the Passover celebration, and he recasts them in light of a new reality, a new creation reality. And now... By taking this and participating in it, we're saying yes, Jesus, to all that you've called us into, to being the one people, the whole church, for his glory. Let's take this together. When Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood, something new has begun, and we celebrate it and anticipate 
the coming in all its fullness of the kingdom when Jesus returns. So let's do this as we eagerly await his coming. Let's take it together.